Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Amen? Amen. Thank you, beautiful Don and Shirley. Welcome to our time of worship here at St. David's. Those who are present here and those that are watching online, we welcome you. I'm, let me correct myself, worshiping online. I hope you'll join us in worship, those that are online with us, not just watch, but also just sing along with us, pray along with us, be attentive to God's word with us. Just a few announcements. Uh, first, thank you, uh, Link family, for uh, supplying the fellowship time of refreshments and everybody enjoying themselves. Uh, again, what a blessed time to be able to just spend a, a few minutes with one another. Uh, we have an announcement that's been several weeks, and I've been seeing it. You've been responding, which is really great, in that we have a, a special training time for Pennsylvania mandated reporters uh, of a child abuse. And read that announcement you'll find there in the bulletin. Sign up at the welcome table there. Any questions, see Peggy Eisenhart. Uh, we are calling today a Mission Sunday with a Bible focus. You'll hear later in the service about the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators and also Gideon's International. So uh, you'll find in your bulletin a information piece, but also a way for you to give to the work of Gideon's. So there's an envelope there attached to this insert. You can, uh, if you're prepared to give a love offering, you can place it in that. And when you depart, put it in the offering plate. Uh, if not, uh, you can even send it right here to the West York camp of the Gideons. I'd like you to add to your prayer list the family of Luella Wagner. Luella passed away on Friday afternoon. And no details yet of her uh, uh, celebration of life and funeral, but we'll keep you informed when we get those details. So pray for her daughter and two sons. A card for you. Thank you to the wonderful family and friends of St. David's, the basket of flowers and the cards to cheer a person. Thank you again, Jackie Brenneman. And Jackie's doing well, and I'm sure will be returning with us very soon. Uh, I want to continue to let you know uh, what's going on here at St. David's. And in the month of May, uh, in the pulpit ministry, we're going to look at the book of Jonah. So maybe you already want to start to start reading through Jonah, uh, maybe even formulate some of those questions. Hopefully will be answered in the month of May. So that's in two Sundays from now that that series will start. Uh, Lori and I want to let you know something that happened on Easter for us. Some of you know that already. Uh, we had a family gathering at the house of 12 family and extended family. And uh, we were given Easter eggs. And one of the Easter eggs contained this little thing here. Uh, a little bunny came to say, we have a baby on the way coming on October 2023. That's from Cody and Mary. They surprised us on Easter afternoon. And uh, so Mary's around 14 months. So we are looking about six. Thank you. Yeah. I thought I could get through the day without a mistake. You all laugh at that too. Okay. But 14 weeks, that would be really overdue. One of a, uh, and, uh, and because Lori's got all these plans and start talking. And I said, we need to make decisions. She says, we have six more months, but I guess it'll go like that, right? So uh, we praise the Lord for the gift of life. They know the sex of the baby, but they haven't revealed it yet. So we're waiting with expectant hearts on that. Uh, and just again, we invite your prayers for Mary and Cody and the baby. So uh, we want to just let you know that. Some of you already know that. Some were shocked in the first service. They had not heard that news, so uh, we're glad to. Where is Sarah? Sarah's here. She's going to give an announcement. I'm surprised she's up because, I mean, she had a really busy day with the Trimmer family. And then we had a great day here yesterday of the wedding of uh, Jacob and Brittany. And uh, some of you were there, and we had a wonderful time of celebrating God's love and marriage. So Sarah is not going to give a report about that. She has something else to talk about. 
Yeah, like he said, it's like I'm, my main focus is about the Seeker Sisters. So um, we're having a reveal, like a reveal and a welcome party next Saturday. I mean, next, not sa next Saturday, next Sunday um, uh, after church at, in room M uh, to start the new year. Consider signing up uh, for the prayer, secret prayer sisters, the sign up sheets at the welcome table. You probably have seen the flyers around the church. So just keep, um, just keep this group in prayer and also consider signing up because it is really encouraging for have somebody to pray for you and, and prayer does do a lot in life and I cannot stress enough how much prayer is really needed in your fellowship, your discipleship with Christ. So just want to let you know that next sun Sunday is uh, the reveal and um, welcome party for the Secret Sisters. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for taking up that ministry. And Peggy Eisenhart has an announcement. Good morning, everyone. This morning when I came in early, I was pegged by several people saying, oh, must be a VBS announcement. You're only, that's the only time we see you for first service. So, yes, uh, I guess I'm known for that. So welcome. I am here to promote VBS. Uh, that will be here before you know it, June the 12th through the 16th. Uh, we, uh, our VBS is held in the morning from 9 a.m. to 11.45. This year we are planning a closing program on Friday night. We've had to put that on the back burner for several years because of COVID. So we're hoping to plan a uh, meal for the families that attend um, VBS on Friday night, and then we'll have a program that follows. So we do have a committee form for that, and we ask for your help there. So please hur hur hurry up here, Miss Donna. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I Donna? Just, I just flew in. I'm from space. Uh, again. Space. Yes. Okay. Double park my space. Double, uh, I'm not surprised there. I've seen you park the bus already. <laughs> Well, there's nobody in space that wants to help out with VBS. No, well, there's a few scattering helpers here, but I know I was just announcing that we don't want people to miss out. We have a sign-up sheet out on the table for people to sign up for VBS, and it is a good experience. You will enjoy yourself. You'll be so blessed because the kids love this. And that's a mission work in our own neighborhood. I don't have to go to space to get people. Absolutely. Well, I don't think you would find many up there anyway, but we're the ones that get blessed when we help with VBS. And we hope that you will take a look at our sign-up sheet. There's still many areas to uh, serve, and we're hoping after today there won't be any places to serve. So hurry, don't miss out, because we do need all hands on deck. We ask that you pray for us. Um, there will also be sponsor, uh, child sponsorship envelopes out on the table out here as well. We ask about $20 per child, and that $20 helps provide each child with the Bible, the Bible Buddies, which have the scripture for the day on each of the Bible Buddies, um, either a CD or we have a digital um, CD that or digital um, component that we can give to children this, uh, this year. So, um, plus the snacks and other expenses. So, please keep us in prayer. Please check out the sign up list. We sure would like to have you come and help us this year. I got a problem. What's your problem, Donna? I lost my keys to my spaceship. Again. <laughs> would these help? Thank you. Donna, are you always this spacey? Oh, boy. Oh, my, thanks. It's going to be an interesting year, so come help us. <laughs> Peggy said what I was thinking. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Again, see them about VBS. There's many ways you can serve at VBS. 
you know, not everybody has to teach, but we have lots of other staffing things that we need. So again, see them, step out of your comfort zone and uh, serve the children with us. Let's stand, welcome one another as the praise team comes to lead us in song. Hello and welcome once again to our service this morning. As always, we are feeling very blessed to be here and to worship with you this morning. And we're going to start out with Mighty is Our God. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And our next song is Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness poured through the shadows of my soul. The Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin. 
is probably pretty familiar to most of you. It's from Hebrews 12, and it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And our final song is Dare to Run.
Living Church family, let's pray together and speak to our Lord. Oh God, our Father, we thank you that we are gathered here today. We have come to worship you. We have come to hear the word. And we have just come to love each other and to love you. I thank you that we are all here today. And I pray, Lord, that we would dare to run that we would dare to run to you and dare to walk with you each and every day. Help us, Lord, as we accomplish that. And we pray everything in the name of Jesus, who is our living hope. Amen. We you take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 119, verses 97 through 112. If you know anything about the Psalms and Psalm 119, Psalm 119 really focuses on the law, the word, the statutes, the precepts of God. And we're, so we're going to read a portion of Scripture reflecting on the word of God. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 97. Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more insight than all my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. I have more understanding than the elders, for I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path, so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts, therefore I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Preserve my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your ways, your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. Amen. The word of God. As much to say in that passage about the, the word of God. And it's a description of a person that has them, reads them, and applies them. But there are many still in this world that do not have the word of God in their own native tongue. And uh, yet there are ministries like Wycliffe Bible translators that have worked through decades in foreign countries uh, to translate the word of God into the language of the people, their na native language, their heart language. And there's still much more work to do. Uh, I believe last time I've heard these numbers, there's about 2,000 still Languages that do not have the word of God in it, of any portion. Uh, but work is being accelerated, thankfully, to uh, technology, uh, the skill of the translators. Also, there's been a change in a lot of ways that Wycliffe will send translators to a land, a tribe, or a people group. And they will teach the nationals, the people that live there, the translation methods. And some languages do not even have a written word. 
So an alphabet has to be created, grammar has to be created, all in the culture of the people. So it takes rather a long time for some of these portions to be done. Uh, but I just saw last year's report by Wycliffe, and their goal that year was to have about 150 language translations begin. By the end of 2022, they were able to have 200 translations to begin work on that. Not completions, but just the start of work there. So uh, Wycliffe and many others are working around the globe to bring the Word of God to the people's language. I want to share with you a video. Uh, I'm not sure if he worked on it. Dan Morey is one of our sponsored uh, missionaries from St. David's. He works at the headquarters at Wycliffe. He's their main videographer right now. Uh, there's a lot of change in staffing and appears to be Dan's the head guy right now. And so pray for Dan and uh, Belinda, their, their, uh, his wife and their children are in Orlando. You can stop by the mission board out there and pick up their newsletter to get an update. They do a wonderful newsletter. And um, uh, I'm hoping maybe I can even get Dan here in May if he comes up to the National Conference of the EC Church and Messiah, if he could drop in on a Sunday and speak with us. Or we've talked about having a Zoom uh, drop in on a worship service live here at the service. So there's things in the works there. But I want to show you again a video that kind of introduces you to Bible translation and the work of Wycliffe Bible translators. We've become accustomed to a world where all our needs are met where nearly everything we could ever want is literally at our fingertips. Food, water, shelter, clothing. We take some things for granted. For us, they've always been there. But what if we didn't have these things? How would it affect our daily lives? It's the same with the Bible. It's our guiding light, showing us the only way to live in a right relationship with God. But what if it wasn't there? What would our lives be like without the Bible? For millions of people in the world, this is still their daily reality. There's not a single word of scripture translated into a language they can clearly understand. That's why Wycliffe exists. At this moment, all around the world, we're working with local churches and communities to speed the light of truth to people still waiting. Because when people get the Bible in their language, they can know the life-giving truth of the good news. They can fully grasp who God is and what Jesus has done for them. They can experience the hope and transformation of God's Word. It's a movement of global proportions, and we won't stop until every person on the planet can access the Bible in a language and format they can clearly understand. So, uh, during our prayer time, we're going to pray for the work of Wycliffe Bible Translators. And so we're going to sing now 270, Wonderful Words of Life. We'll dismiss the children to Junior Church Ministries at this time. 270, Wonderful Words of Life.
Let's pray together. Oh Lord, your words are wonderful and they bring life. Without your words, we would not know of you. Well, of course, the skies, the, the stars, the planets, your creation would proclaim your glory. But nothing special would have been revealed until your word came and the word became flesh, Jesus among us. So, Lord, we thank you for your written, revealed word that is without error, that speaks the truth. And, Lord, we say thank you for giving the word into our language. But we pray for those who still do not have the written word of God. The gospel may be preached to those without the word, the written word. And then the spirit is there in the, in the words of the evangelist, the preacher, are heard and responded to, and your Holy Spirit brings them new life. But they need discipleship. They need to know more about you. They need to know your blessings. They need to know your calling upon their life and your commands. So we pray for the ministries like Wycliffe uh, that will translate the word of God and have done it faithfully through the decades. We ask you to bless the missionaries, bless the staff of Wycliffe and other Bible translating ministries. Raise up more workers. As some retire from the work in the field, we need more workers to come, Lord, and just bless that effort. And Lord, uh, we celebrate as we hear the reports of the written word coming to language, language groups that never have had it before. We pray specifically for the Maury's. Help Dan in his work at Wycliffe to uh, record the stories of Bible translation and its impact and the changed lives, Lord. Give him discernment. Give him safety when he goes to the field to record these reports and then coordinate it all together to make it a presentation publicly and around the world. Lord, we pray for the work of the Gideons. They do not do translation, but they distribute your word. And we thank you for their ministry, Lord. And we just ask you to equip every Gideon to go forth and place the scriptures where you lead them, to share the gospel message when asked. And when they ask, do you know Jesus? Lord, may your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. A few months ago, I was contacted by uh, the State uh, Association of Gideons and saying we're having our... Uh, state convention in Gettysburg near you, uh, would you like us to send a speaker to you? We're sending, I think, 80 speakers, they said, out into the territory uh, from the state convention. And uh, so I said, sure. We haven't had a speaker from Gideon's for quite a while. And uh, they're a great ministry. And you're going to hear that, how wonderful they are and what they do. And uh, so I signed it up. And uh, 
didn't know until about a month ago or less who was coming, Mark Gillette. And uh, after I introduced myself to Mark and we started talking, I had met Mark several years ago. Uh, if you recall, some of us, adults and youth, went down to Reading area to a camp meeting that the EC Church has. is called Rosedale Camp Meeting. And we went down to help work on the grounds, improve things there. And uh, talking to Mark, and he said, yeah, I have a, a cottage at Rosedale. Him and his wife, Deb, have a cottage there, and, and they work there. And he said he does work in Haiti. And I think, yeah, we met a guy when we went to Rosedale camp meeting to work and never remembered your name, Mark, sorry. But I do remember you and your story about the Haiti. But I didn't know you were a Gideon at the time. Now, he's come to talk about the works of the Gideons. We have to come, have him come back to speak about the work that's going on in Haiti through a ministry that he's involved with. But uh, amazing things how God brings it all together. And so, Mark, come and share with us about the work of the Gideons. Mark Gillette. Well, thank you for allowing us to come today and be with you. God does work things together for his good, for our good and his good as well. But um, there are no coincidences with God. And um, we actually that came up during Sunday school that we just came from downstairs that um, it's not coincidences that God brings things together. That's one. I saw it, um, the Hebrews 12, she was saying, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, seeing we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run the race that's set before us, laying aside every sin and the weight which easily entangles us. And um, we, those verses were actually part of one of the speakers this weekend. I know it comes together. And the Dare to Run a song that was run there. I'll be running a half marathon in two weeks um, in Cincinnati. And uh, so Darren, when you're going to run, you, you lay aside all the weight. You don't carry any extra weight with you. And God has made it. He's put the re resources where we're going. It's like Elijah when he sent him out. Uh, he said, you go and there will be what you need for food will be there. The ravens came not to where Elijah was. He, he sent the ravens to where he told Elijah to go. So he always prepares us and supplies for us what we need. And Philippians 4.19 says, For our God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ. So the Gideon ministry, um, just a brief overview. I know you don't want a lot of statistics, but the Gideons are Christian business and professional men who, it's wrong to say we volunteer because actually it's a calling. Uh, if God puts a call on your life, and each of us has a calling on our life. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you individually, says the Lord, thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a future and a hope in the newer translations. King James, this is what I grew up and learned, is uh, to give you an expected end, which means he has a plan for you. Uh, Ephesians 2.10 says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So he has a plan for each of us, and we just need to be available. Uh, you probably heard the greatest ability you can give God is your availability. So Gideons are surrendered. They're men who endeavor to, to follow Christ in their daily walk, and they have either a business or a training. It could be a teacher of any four-year degree. Um, you could be a lawyer. Even lawyers can be Gideons uh, and Christians. Um, some of us may doubt that. But <laughs> dentists, doctors, um, any profession like that. But there's also ways to be part of the Gideon ministry, which I'll explain a little later. But the state convention, we have 2,647 Gideon and auxiliary members in Pennsylvania. There are 100, there's 100 times that in the world. So there's 264,000 Gideons worldwide on your behalf that just are doing the work of the church. We're an extended missionary arm of this church. So when you give money for Bibles, every penny goes for the Bibles. Gideons pay their own expenses. And we live in those communities. We don't have to learn a new language if we don't want to. We don't have to leave our jobs. We don't have to 
move our families. Uh, we are, big word, indigenous, just means we live there. And so we represent you, but without a pastor's recommendation, a man can't be a Gideon. So it starts in the church with people coming to Christ through however they do. They're growing up. You mentioned that you have people from this church in Wycliffe um, translating. So you know you send people out to do things. Well, Gideons can be in your local neighborhood, and they go out to put Bibles in hotels and motels, which is what we're most recognized for. We're in 93 different languages right now in hard copy, but we also have a Bible app that makes available 1,900 languages, and, and this is a free app. And I had an opportunity to, to minister in India a few years ago, and they have 14 official languages in India. I know there are countries that have even more than that, but we distributed in Marathi and in Telugu, in English, in Hindi, in Sindhi, um, different languages that they have there, the Bible app will actually read the Bible to you as well. So if you're traveling and uh, driving your car and you want to catch up on your reading, you can actually choose the chapter, choose the book that you want to study, and it will read to you in any one of those 1900 languages. I assume most of us would want English or maybe Spanish in this area, but that's available. And for those like in Haiti, Pastor mentioned we have a ministry in Haiti. There's only a 26% literacy rate there in Haiti, but they may not be able to read, but they can listen to the Bible being read to them. So this Bible app is really, really beneficial in Haiti. Again, not about a lot of statistics, but um, we on an annual basis, we usually have around $150 million uh, entrusted to us to place in the ballpark of before COVID, it was around 80 million copies of God's Word every year. So just to give you an idea, I know st statistics, I like to say if more people, if you took everyone that has a tendency to fall asleep in church and laid them end to end, they'd all be more comfortable. That's about... <laughs> probably the only statistic you really wanted to hear, but I wanted to give you an idea of, on your behalf, when you give to beginning ministry, that's how far your outreach is. Um, Jesus said in Matthew, that go into all the world and preach the gospel. I mean, it, it's a command. It wasn't a suggestion. Well, how do you do that? Well, he didn't, he said, start in Jerusalem. Uh, you'll receive power, Acts 1.8, after the, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and under the uttermost part of the world. Started in Jerusalem, right where you are. And you can be right here and still send out God's word all over the world and know that on your behalf, because you care, other people are getting God's word. Um, why do we do it? Well, Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void. It shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I send it. So we just trust God to keep his word. He said, you send it out and I'll use it in a mighty way. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is quick. It means alive, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing, piercing to the dividing asunder of both soul and spirit and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Um, when you read God's word, we get to hear testimonies, and this weekend we had what we call a live testimony, uh, a person who was actually saved through a Gideon Testament or Bible at our convention. We had several of them come and share their testimonies, how God reached them through the written word. One of the ladies, Sandy Boyd, was raised in a home that was steeped in witchcraft, and she had never heard the gospel. Her father was um, kept them on drugs, taught them how to do seances. It was uh, a very dark lifestyle that she tried to escape uh, at age, I believe it was 14, she left and started running. She got married by the time she was 18. That She had a, a son, which because of her drug use was eventually taken away from her. She ran to get away from her father and get out of this whole culture of witchcraft. But he came and found her again, even though she had gone up to Seattle, Washington, he found her. And she thought being, re being married, he wouldn't be able to find her, wouldn't know her name, but somehow he tracked her down. That happened twice in her life. She married three times, I believe. But um, she had a daughter, and at 
His daughter was two years old, and still she was being visited by these demons, and etc. She went out into a field to kill herself and parked her car, and she leaned the seat back, and this was a car that uh, someone had given her. Her hand fell down, and, and she was just beside herself, and it touched something next to her seat, and it happened to be a Gideon Testament that someone God had put there somehow. And through that testament, she didn't kill herself that day. She read through a, some of the testament, but she got to the back, and it said, if you pray this prayer, God can save you and, and change your life. So that night, she said that's, she just kept repeating that prayer. She said she felt such a peace come over her that she had never had in her entire life. Well, God's using her in ministry now. She's married to a pastor. And they have a beautiful family, and um, the kids, their kids are grown and, and in ministry. So, you know, God had that testament in the right place at the right time, and we get to hear those kind of testimonies time and time again. Um, I was in Mexico. Again, Gideons work where they live, but we have special opportunities to go and help train Gideons in other countries. And I was in Mexico standing outside a military install installation at 6 in the morning. It was still dark. We were told there's no guns here in this installation. It's just offices. Well, at about 7 o'clock, um, I heard reveille being played. The gates swung open, and these military trucks came out with armed <laughs> military people. And I'd been standing there offering testaments to guys as they went to work, but it was in the dark. So some of them took it. Some of them were suspicious of, of what I was handing out. And they all had guns. <laughs> and I said, well, this is not a, a safe place to be. As they rolled out, the truck, first truck slowed down enough for me to offer a testament to the driver and the other guy in the cab. And they started to take off the guys in the back. There were maybe 20 guys in the back of this truck all shouting, I want one, I want one, in Spanish. I mean, it, um, I don't know a lot of Spanish, but un regalo para ti means a free gift for you. And uh, so our testaments come packed in fives uh, with a uh, paper, brown paper band around it. Well, I had a few of them loose so I could give them to individual people coming to work. But these truckload of guys all wanted them, so I'm reaching into the box, throwing these <laughs> packs of five testaments into the back of the truck so they could all have one. There was another truck behind them, and they were wondering what I'm lofting, what I'm you know, throwing into the back of this truck. Their guns came out. It was a little testy. Um, but they all wanted a copy of God's Word. And we see that in other countries. There's a hunger for God's Word that um, we can hardly imagine. As the, you were watching that video about Wycliffe, how we have so much, and it's hard for us to understand what it's like to live in a country where you don't have God's word, or you don't have access to it, or it costs so much you can't afford it. In 1989, when the um, Iron Curtain came down, we were finally allowed to go into what was formerly Russia, or the Soviet Union of all those countries, to hand out God's word. And we started handing out an, on a rate of 200,000 a month. 200,000 copies of God's Word a month. Some of them are going into hotels. In the United States, the average useful life of a Bible in a hotel in the United States is six years. And every six years, we take all the Bibles out of a hotel and put in new ones. The used ones go to bed and breakfast, small motels, uh, Salvation Army, go to prisons, they go to uh, rescue missions, etc. But in the Soviet Union, the average useful life was two days because people had not been able to get a Bible for so long. And at that point in time, a Bible in Russia, former Russia, cost a month's salary. And so they couldn't afford it. And they said, well, God will forgive us if we take this one. Um, so they would take a Bible out of the hotel room. So that's why for years it continued at a rate of 200,000 every month. And uh, we had some guys that were there handing out Bibles to the military there and also to schools and hospitals and nursing homes and helping just enlist Gideons because it had been so long since the Word of God was even allowed in those countries. That we didn't have Gideon ministry uh, established there, but we do now. And they were, there were two guys standing on the street in Kishinev, which is a province of Russia, and they watched this Soviet policeman. He was stopping cars and he was waving a testament in their face, and then the car would drive off. And they watched that for an hour or so, and finally, when they were going to finish their distribution, they went over and asked what this Soviet policeman was doing, and he said, well, you guys were at our barracks 
uh, last week, and you gave us all a copy of God's Word. He said, I've never had it. I've been reading it, and I think that if everyone lived by the principles that are in this God's Word, our world would be a much better place. So when I stop a motorist now, I tell him he needs to read the Bible, and if they agree with me, I let him go with a warning, but if they argue with me, I give them a ticket. So, you know, there are opportunities. It changes hearts and lives, uh, for sure. Our wives are um, the auxiliary. We, I, in Haiti, there, we often don't have electricity. It can go, the longest I've known of is three months without the government giving us electricity. That's how they say it. Oh, they didn't give us electricity today. That makes uh, 10 weeks in a row. You know, it, it happens. But normally, throughout the course of a week, I usually spend a week there every month, and it might be three days without electricity. So I know what it's like to run on auxiliary power, on uh, generated power or even solar power. But the auxiliary are the wives of Gideons, and they have their own areas of distribution. It's like doctors and dentist offices, women's prisons. They go with us on distributions to college campuses. Uh, nursing homes, hospitals, etc. So they have their opportunity to hand things out. I didn't realize, I know God's word is powerful, but I had a, um, a nurse come up to me after a presentation I did in New Jersey, and she was working at the Veterans Hospital, and she asked for a, a copy of a large print testament. So when, when you're lying down, even if you have good eyesight, uh, you're in a hospital, uh, it's much easier to read large print. So that's what we put in it. It's a New Testament with Psalms in it. And um, she said, I gave my copy to a resident there at the Veterans um, Hospital who admitted that he couldn't read anymore. He, his eyesight was bad, damaged, and I don't know how it was injured exactly. But he said, I just want to hold on to it. I just want to hold it. And... Uh, Choked me up. So she wanted to replace her copy because she gave him her copy and she wanted a large print copy for him and to replace the one that she had herself. Um, I was at a college campus. We stand on college campuses because you care and provide testaments on your behalf. We get to go to college campuses. I was at a one in Maine called SMVTI, Southern Maine Vocational Technical Institute. And it was January in Maine on the coast, if you can imagine it. It was about 10 degrees and the snow was blowing. And so we were invited to stand inside the cafeteria to hand out God's word as kids came to eat lunch. And um, at the end of that two hour period, I think it was approximately, there were some kids that had left the Testaments behind. There was, as they came in, we kind of cold conked them. They didn't know what they were getting. And some of them, they were pretty gracious and would take it. And if they decided they didn't want it, there was a few scattered around the cafeteria that were left behind. So we were picking those up. And one of the cafeteria workers came out from behind the counter and came over to me and said, I'm so glad to see you here. This was January. She said, um, my son was killed in an accident Thanksgiving week last year. He left for college in September. He had never professed faith in Christ. And we my husband and I have been praying for him, but um, he had never received Christ. He went to college, and on the way home for, for Thanksgiving weekend, he was killed in, a, in an automobile accident. And they were devastated, of course. Um, the school packed together all this stuff in the trunk and sent it to the family, but she said, we just didn't have the courage to open it up. And she, I finally did last week, and in it was a green testament. I don't have a... They're all the same. They just have different colors on the outside so that we can know where, where they were distributed. But she said, we got this Green Testament, and I looked through it. It had his name written, and it said presented to, and his, her son had written his name. And then as she leafed through the Testament, there were verses underlined and question marks and comments written in the side. So we knew she, had, he, she knew he had spent some time in it. She got to the back, and the decision page had on October 26, he had surrendered his life to Christ. So although at that point, this testament today would cost it $1.56, it was precious to her. It was priceless because she knew her son had accepted Christ as a savior. So she called her son's roommate and he said, yeah, um, I forget the boy's name. That's a, probably an integral part of the, the testimony. But he um, had accepted Christ and been studying in this local Bible study. And his roommate had suggested that he call his parents and let them know. And she, he said, Should, they'll be excited. And she, he said, no, I want to tell them in person. So he was waiting for Thanksgiving 
holiday to tell his parents in person, and he never made it home. So although that Bible only cost $1.56, it was priceless to his mother and, and father. So to date, we have placed over 2.5 billion copies of God's Word in, since 1908, and that's because churches care. Church, our, our ministry is really twofold. We speak in churches to raise money for the Bibles, and like I said, every penny goes to the Bibles. We pay our own expenses. And then the second part of our ministry is to be good stewards of that money, buy the right testaments, the right color testaments, the right, you know, enough hard copy Bibles for the hotels, enough large print testaments for the hospitals and nursing homes um, to not waste any money that's given to us to place God's word. You don't want seed in the barn. I, I grew up on a farm, so seed in the barn doesn't do you any good. It's only when you plant it, so you got to get it out. So we want to make sure that's why we need business and professional people that know how to handle finances and money um, so that we use them wisely. I heard a guy shout, hey, ain't you even going to give us anything to read? Ken Smith was in a high security prison in Alabama, and he had been caught AWOL from, he was dealing drugs, and he was in the military, but he started skipping out on the military, and he and his friend had, I believe it was called a ninja rocket, um, a motorcycle that goes, as they would say in Maine, wicked fast. And uh, he was flying down a, a highway in Alabama when a police cruiser came up alongside of him and told him to pull over. And they just laughed and said, he could never catch up to us. So they went faster. And the cruiser came up again, alongside of him again. They went a little faster. They, finally, they topped out, and this cruiser was staying alongside of him. Ken ended up in a high-security jail where he wasn't even allowed to wear clothes. It, they would rinse these guys down once a day with a hose. They fed them twice a day by shoving a tray under the bars, and they weren't allowed to be talked to at all. The guards were not, they were ordered not to talk to these guys. So Ken had shouted at one point, ain't you going to give me anything to read? And that night, the guard came back with a tray of his food, and it had a Gideon Bible on it. It did not have a cover. They take the hard covers off so they don't have a weapon. But he slid it under the bars and said, and this guard broke the rules. He said, there's only one group of people that care about you guys. That's the Gideons. Well, you are the Gideons. You know, we couldn't be Gideons without you. But Ken came to Christ through that Bible. And years later, I met Ken because he put the floors in my new home in Vermont. Ken and his wife um, both became Christians. Um, and he became a Gideon, actually, and, and had a business, a flooring business in Vermont. And they were in their early 30s when I met him. Um, but even in prison, and I get to go to prisons every Wednesday and do counseling in the prisons, but the Berks County Jail and New York County Prison, we have people there every Sunday handing out God's Word. I go on Wednesdays, um, but we have a, an arrangement with the chaplain, chaplain staff there at Berks County Jail System that everyone, every man and woman being processed in is offered a testament, and then we get to, to counsel them, and they have questions or don't know, and many of them know nothing about the Bible. And in the front are helps, where to find help when anxious, depressed, discouraged, leaving home. Um, and it doesn't just say like Colossians 2, 6, and 7, it gives you a page number. And the guys always are telling me how important that is to them because they have no clue where to start in the Bible. So because you care, the Bibles are available to these guys in prison. And we get testimonies all the time, but... Um, I'll just tell you one of Matthew Favre, who was in jail because he, uh, it's his second DUI in a year, but in this case, he had been in an accident that killed people, including the guy in his car, and Matthew had a collapsed lung, he had an eye that was, wouldn't track anymore, it was, he couldn't see out of that eye, his pancreas stopped working, um, he had spent the first three months in jail in a coma in the medical department, and they had removed the front part of his brain, and they said, you'll never be able to control your emotions because we took that part of your brain out. Well, I was talking with Matthew. He came up to the chapel. He said he didn't even really know why, but he had no, no biblical background. But I was able to lead Matthew to the Lord, and I told him, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. 
So I said, you don't have to accept that diagnosis. God's given you a sound mind as a believer. Two weeks later, I'm only allowed to see the same guy every two weeks because they, there are so many gangs in the prison. They bring a certain group of gangs up that get along together one week, and the next week it's the other gangs. So they don't mix them up. And uh, so two weeks later, talking to Matthew, he said he had told me that whenever he plays cards, if he loses, he just loses his temper. He loses everything. Uh, and he had told him that he would never lo no longer be able to control that. Well, I said, that's not true. Two weeks later, he said, I asked him, how did you do with your temper? And he said, I haven't lost my temper in two weeks. And as I worked with him for the next several months, he was actually sent up to state. But it, while I worked with him, this collapsed lung that he had that the doctors had tried to reinflate for three months and couldn't, they gave it up and said, you just lost a lung. It came back, it reinflated, they couldn't say why. His eye that was just wavering around and he couldn't see out of it came back into focus with the other eye. Um, and his pancreas came back working again. And they couldn't explain why that is. We could, because God is a God. Uh, he said, I've, the thief came only to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. 10. But I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Well, and then I'm thinking also of Psalm 84.11, that the, the Lord is a sword and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. Well, isn't health a good thing? Isn't having a job a good thing? Um, isn't it um, having peace? I mean, the, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it's not fruits. It is the fruit. It just includes love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. All those things are part of the fruit of the Spirit. They're promised to us as believers. And because you care, we get that word out. That's what we're supposed to do. We're recognized for placing God's word, but our primary purpose is to lift up Christ, to win the lost. We do that through placing God's word, but it's being Jesus with skin on. Like each one of you, if you wake up above ground, you're on a mission field, and we just represent you to the world outside your church. So thank you for that opportunity, and thank you for supplying the Bibles that we need. And you might say, how can I help? Well, certainly pray for the ministry like you did this morning. Appreciate that. There's a retiring offering. Not that I'm retiring, but as you leave, there, you know, you have a, a envelope in your bulletin that the pastor uh, referred to. If you're not prepared today and you wanted to give Bibles, uh, you could send a check in that envelope. Just put a stamp on it in your check, and it'll go to the York West Camp. And again, every penny will be used for Bibles. Uh, if you are interested in knowing more about the Gideons, to become a Gideon, I would love to talk to you about that. There's also the Friends of the Gideons, where uh, you can get the Gideon Bibles um, for your own distribution. We usually hand out these testaments. We carry personal workers' testaments because if you don't have a testament with you and you go to witness to someone, you're unarmed. Uh, this morning, we gave one at Starbucks to a lady. Uh, well, actually, it was the man. The lady already was a believer. She, uh, but we give them out all the time. Um, again, on your behalf, and thanks again for having us here, and we appreciate your fellowship in this ministry and uh, opportunity to work together. Striving together, that was our theme verse uh, from Colossians 2, 6, and 7, striving together for the gospel, and uh, that's what we do with you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, he's just filled with knowledge of the Gideon ministry and filled with scripture. Did you catch all the scripture he had in his message? Thank you. And uh, uh, the first service was different from the second service. You, I thought I was expecting the same thing. I, I had some already. There's a story from the first service that I wanted you to tell them. So uh, great. And I'm blessed with, again, hearing your word and hearing the testimonies there. And thank you for your work and service. And uh, you're a busy guy. Isn't he a busy guy? And he has a little business that I'd love to have come to my house. He's a hired, what do you call it? Rent a handyman. Rent a handyman. My wife's saying, yeah, we could use you. But he lives all the way over in Warnersville, okay? Uh, Berks County, but Mark, thank you. Thank you so much, and Deb, thank you. And uh, may God bless your lives and ministry with the Gideons, but also uh, Haiti. And I think we're gonna try to get you back here talking about Haiti, okay? Well, let's uh, pray a moment. Lord, we thank you for the word. 
and the life trans transformation that brings to our lives with the Spirit. And Lord, we pray for those who don't have the word yet, but may your timing, your will be done that they do get it and they respond. And may we be a part of it. In Jesus' name, amen. We stand with me and sing 579, Jesus Loves Me. Now, why did I select Jesus Loves Me today? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's what we're celebrating today. 579, Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me. 